Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome everybody. Let's just wait for one more minute and then we'll get started. Thanks for being here. All right, let's wait for one more minute and uh, we'll kick it off. I see some familiar faces, so that's great. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Okay. Let's kick it off. Uh, welcome everybody to Tuesday evening. We're happy that you're here and spend this hour with us where we're gonna talk about ethics and AI and explore this from different perspectives. So the objective of tonight's event for the University of Chicago alumni and friends uh, is the following. We wanna demystify this topic. We wanna to provide you insights into how to think about this topic of ethics and AI rather than finding definitive answers. And we want to inspire you to participate in the industrialization and the next phase of AI in ways that are most relevant for you. So today, as we cover this topic, uh, we will help you to think about this complex topic, to get you aspired to engage with data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. My name is Joy Shen. I'm a University of Chicago College alumni and University of Chicago Booth alumna. I've been working in the enterprise software data and technology investing innovation space my career, entire career. And I'm excited about where we're going in the AI space. It is a lot of opportunities and also a lot of complexities. And today I hope that this panel will provide you a lot of value as you think about these complex questions. And in the way that we typically do for University of Chicago style, we will probe these complex questions and help you to think about these questions further. So let me turn to the panelists for them to introduce themselves and their background. And then we'll dive into tonight's topic. John, we'll start with you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Joyce, for having me. It's nice to be here with you all. Um, I'm John Basil. Um, I'm a moral philosopher, obviously. Uh, it's, um, I work in AI and data ethics. I work at the Northeastern Ethics Institute where I lead our AI and data ethics initiatives. And I'm an associate professor of philosophy at the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Northeastern University. Not to be confused with Northwestern. Trivani. Great, thank you so much, Joyce. And thanks folks for having me here today. Uh, my name is Trivani Gandhi. I am a responsible AI lead at DataIQ which is an end-to-end -end data science software. Uh, and I guess I come to data science by way of my PhD in political science, where I first learned a bunch of stats and learned how to use programs like R uh, that helped me transition into a field of data analytics and eventually into a, a world of data science. So 
I consider myself a Jill of all trades data scientist. I uh, do a little bit of everything, but now my main focus is on helping our clients actually scale responsible AI programs within their own um, within their own analytics programs. So yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight's chat. Donnie. Yep. Thanks, Joyce. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Donnie uh, Theron. I'm a, a senior manager at Google, and so I work in our internal audit uh, organization, uh, which is sort of a, a cross alphabet team. And what we kind of do is focus really on various different types of risks across the organization and the products that are part of the portfolio. Um, and sort of in my capacity as the lead of our data science team, we focus a lot on um, auditing and assurance and transparency and accountability of machine learning systems is sort of part of our uh, remit inside the company. And, and that's maybe the, the connecting point here. Great. Well, as, as you can see, we have assembled a very diverse panel representing both academia and industry from a different perspective. And hopefully we will be able to uncover some of interesting questions and thoughts in this multidisciplinary fashion. So let's start with John. You have done a lot of work in ethics. You're a philosopher by training. You also now focus your work on applied ethics, specifically as it relates to technology and artificial intelligence. So just to set the ground for us, what is ethics? How should we think about ethics in general? I didn't know I was going to ask get asked such hard questions. Uh, uh, so I'm sort of ethics is it's, it's a field like biology in the sense that it's sort of there's a way to describe it, which is sort of trivial, which is just studies what we should do. Um, but that's not very helpful. Um, so the way to think about it is, is um, it's easy to make a distinction between theoretical ethics and applied ethics, theoretical ethics, like theoretical physics, answers foundational questions like what ultimately is a good life? Um, what's the ultimate theory of right and wrong? Whereas applied ethics is more like theoretical physics or trying to build a rocket or engineering or something. It's how do we think about the ethical issues and values as they arise in particular contexts? What kind of tools and resources can we draw on from the theory side, married with some facts about the world to sort of make sure we're integrating values, thinking about values. Um, and in the technology space, for the way I think about it, it's about how do we build a system that lets us make sure we incorporate values in the design, deployment, development of technologies? So that's a really broad answer. I'm happy to follow up and answer more specifically, but that's sort of how I think about the field. Thank you for that. So let's talk about some of the research questions that you have been probing. I think they're really interesting. So one of the questions is, for example, how should autonomous vehicles be programmed to behave when causing harm is unavoidable? And another question you have raised is, is it unethical to attempt to create conscious artificial intelligence. Maybe tell our audience a bit more about the specific kind of research, research questions that you're probing and perhaps touch on one of them. Yeah, sure. Let me start with my sort of big picture approach to this space. Unlike every other area where we do a decent job of managing ethical issues, um, every other area has what we call an ethics ecosystem. There's robust resources for thinking through the ethical challenges and problems, and we don't have that in the AI space. And so we keep running into roadblocks, PR disasters and ethical disasters almost every day. Um, and that's partly because um, it's partly the philosopher's fault. We've done a really bad job of understanding the technologies and so applying our theoretical tools in a useful way. And it's partly on the technologists because if you're a technologist, like what you wanna do is solve everything at the level of the model, or you want a single auditing tool that tells you what fairness is and whether you've achieved it. And neither of those approaches are realistic. You need to sort of create interdisciplinary practice. So almost all my work is about diagnosing, like in the autonomous vehicle case, when philosophers start talking about trolley problems and telling you how those things apply to autonomous vehicles, they sort of misunderstand how machine learning powers those tools. And so a lot of my stuff is diagnosing technical details so that when we try to apply the tools of ethics, we're doing it in a meaningful, useful way. So I, I do, I mean, some of my research is unconsciousness, but I'll just talk about the AV stuff for a second. Um, so if people know about trolley cases, there's a train running down the tracks, you can, someone bystander can pull a switch. If they do, it'll divert the trolley and kill one person instead of five. And some people, these are, these are famous thought experiments in philosophy. And some people have thought, well, some driving accident scenarios might look just like those trolley cases. So can't we just look at what the answers are in the trolley cases and apply them to autonomous vehicles? But that's sort of the, the lesson of my work is that once you see that what you're really doing is training an algorithm to do image recognition, so ultimately driving across a huge range of scenarios, the real ethical questions are about what does it mean to responsibly design a training regime? What does it mean to responsibly build your test set? How do you validate those results? And so 
bringing the tools to bear on those specific machine learning oriented questions. And trolley cases can play a role because they're tools for testing theories, but they're not meant to tell us something about the real world as it is. They're really meant to help us inform the principles we use to do value sensitive machine learning, training, design, deployment, and development. Okay. So let's pause there and we'll come back to some of the things you talk about sure. and go to Trevani and Donnie. Your backgrounds are unique. You were not trained as classic data scientists, but you have worked in data science almost all your life, especially in the complex matters that you're focusing on now. So you're kind of stewards of AI programs for your companies and in the industry, because you're taking on these new responsibilities that probably didn't exist a couple of years ago. So tell us more about what you do, perhaps. What is your mandate? Who do you work with in the industry, in your organization? And what kind of questions do you generally ask? So perhaps we start with Trevani and then we move to Donnie. Sure. Yeah, um, it's funny that you said that I'm working in a job that probably didn't exist a few years ago because it did it. Uh, when I started at DataIQ, I joined as a data scientist. I was working with clients directly, helping them implement their AI systems into using our software, right? Which is like this very open, open source thing that anybody can pick up and use. Uh, and as that was, you know, as I was doing that kind of work, I was noticing more and more in the field around interpretability and explainability. And I thought this is an interesting area to continue diving into, which then led me more into the like ethical, socio-technical questions around the responsible use of AI. Uh, and over time that led to me working with my, you know, working with people in product, working with people in strategy to say, look, we need to actually think about this as a company that sells a software to other people. We should be actually making sure that we're doing it, like we're giving them the tools to do it the right way. And even if it's like, okay, our tools can do X amount of the work, we're also giving them like thinking and critical thinking skills on how to do this work the right way. So yeah, my job did not exist a couple of years ago. And, and you know, <laughs> I try to like tell myself that when I feel anxious about where my career is going, because like, who knows what job I'll have in five years because it might not exist yet. And so I think that's an exciting part of this space. But yeah, definitely um, a lot of my work is interdisciplinary because of, I think, the background I bring to bear. But uh, it is a lot working with folks that are in charge of governance, oversight, as well as um, ethical AI programs within their companies to make sure that they're creating um, those programs and you know, value systems up front that can then help guide the use of AI. And AI in this case is a very broad term, right? We could mean analytics, we could mean data science, we could mean a simple churn prediction model, um, those values that guide the use of AI uh, and then helping them figure out also the change management that has to go with it. Because it's not just enough to set the values, you also have to have a way to do that, which I think Dan Donnie would probably have a lot more insight on based on his, his experience. I have more questions for what you just, about what you just said, Trevani, but yes, yeah, so let's move to Donnie now. And Donnie, you started your career as internal auditor. And who knew that now you are running the audit program for machine learning AI systems at Google. So again, tell us more about what you do and who you work with and how should people think about this emerging field that you're leading. Yeah, sure. And so I think it's it's helpful to kind of like frame a little bit where internal audit sort of comes from, right? So like the, the early traditions of the profession is, hey, if you're a publicly traded company in the United States, you're required to have your financial statements uh, audited. Uh, and you're sort of required to, to have those audited by an independent third party. And so this is sort of like all the, the big public accounting firms that, um, that some of you might recognize. So KPMG, Ernst & Young, PwC, uh, BDO, those folks. Um, but the sort of hidden semi in the shadows are their counterparts, which is the internal audit organization within the companies that are being audited. And if you think about them, you know, we've got practitioners, we've got engineers, data scientists, product managers building products out in the field. Um, we have organizations within the company that are thinking about, hey, we need to be ISO, ISO, you know, whatever, alphabet soup compliant. We need to be SOX compliant. We need to have an SSA 16 certification because our customers want to see that, to know that we've got good and controls in place around the, the services that we provide them. 
Um, and then you've got this sort of like third entity within organizations, which is internal audit. And they're really sort of like the last bastion of defense from an internal organizational perspective to make sure that has everybody dotted their I's, has everyone crossed their T's, you know, we put on our independent hat as independent as one can be having your paycheck come from the company that you're auditing. Um, and we try to think about, you know, um, have, we, have we put in reasonable effort? Is there um, reasonable reason to believe that we're meeting these different requirements that we're subject to? And so we go audit and we basically validate those types of assertions. And, you know, the profession grew up very much uh, focused on the accounting and finance industry. But over the last like 40 years or so, since like the 80s, 90s, the focus has really expanded quite a lot to like operational concerns as well. And so that's kind of where I find myself today is, you know, this is one of the newer types of risk we need to think about. And, and for auditors, it's all about risk, right? And so we're either evaluating a process system or tool against a compliance requirement or an internal policy or some type of inherent risk that that product or process poses to whatever constituency. It can be to the company, it can be to the users, the communities where we deliver our products. Um, and so I kind of see this like quite firmly in the tradition of, of where the profession has grown up, which is this is a new technology. It's being deployed in products that are affecting real people. As a company, we have a responsibility to think about like the risks associated and inherent with that. And how do we as independently as we can do our homework and due diligence and validating that we're doing the right thing um, before, you know, we, we, we kind of deploy those systems in the real world. Okay. So I heard a lot of keywords in what you just said, value system, risk, oversight, governance. And one of the questions from the audience, from Sashin, is we have built products, offer products for years. And why is ethics and responsibility and all these things that we're talking about a top uh, concern for machine learning AI. And so perhaps let's talk about that from your perspective and then we'll go back into how should we think about this practically. So as data scientists, how would you, or practitioners in the field, how would you differentiate or describe the reason for having such a big emphasis on ethics and AI? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I think that it's really interesting that you opened the panel by asking John about autonomous vehicles, right? Because like that is a huge use case where we need to think about the ethics of, of AI, 100% agreed. But it's also not the thing that's going uh, currently affecting us on the day-to-day -day level that we should be concerned about, right? Um, and so when we think about, or we look back at like the past six, seven years of news coming out around huge AI failures, things like medical algorithms being incredibly biased against black people, um, pharmacies denying people who are in chronic pain um, medication because some algorithm somewhere has flagged them as abusers, even if they're not, um, banking unfairness, lending unfairness, uh, targeted ads, I, I could go on, right? But when you think about the way that AI is touching our lives every day and all of the ways that is failing people uh, and failing to actually help us create the kind of world we wanna live in, uh, the ethical imperative for for responsible AI or the ethics of software and AI becomes super clear. Um, so it's not necessarily that like there's this big looming robot terminator on the on the horizon and that's why we need to think about this, but really it's that there are things happening to us right now every day that are much more harmful to us and far less like flashy. Yeah, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Yeah, that, I think that's exactly right. I mean, one thing it's so it's 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 an interesting sociological question why there wasn't any sort of major effort to construct an ethics ecosystem or ethics infrastructure for traditional software development. But I think it's just a random contingency that grows out of a Silicon Valley mentality of move fast and break things where ethics is dog fooding, um, where you just try out your own product. But there are scholars that have been thinking about the worries about the internet and software and the ethical challenges for a long time. I think what's distinctive about AI is the nature of the decision making we're willing to or interested in turning over to or supplementing with AI is the kind of thing we already take to be ethically sensitive decision making. So decisions about recidivism prediction, decisions about lending, things that like, so software helps make those decisions too, but in much more hidden ways. And so I think that's been less outcry. So it's, it's 
it's true that I think AI exacerbates the need for building these ethics systems, but we should have had them in the first place and earlier, and they should apply to regular software development, although the nuances will be importantly different, I think. Donnie, yeah. you want to add? Yeah, sure. You know, and I, I think it has to do with, you know, if we, we sort of look at the history of automation, it, it might also have something to do with the territory that we're starting to tread in, which is rather than, you know, labor starting to look at reasoning uh, and automation of those types of tasks. And I think the other factor at play here too is, you know, at least in traditional software systems, which are largely deterministic, so we can give it a single input and we know based on how the system is built exactly what we can expect at the end. And so we can control for those edge, well, <laughs> to the degree that we can think about those edge cases and be creative and bring the right people into thinking about those edge cases, um, we can at least try to control for them. And it, it seems like a more narrow bounded space, but you know, a lot of these systems that we're dealing with today on the machine learning and AI side are like stochastic inherently. And you know, their abilities and their failings and the errors and the mistakes that they make are largely a function of the architectures and training data, which is like, all of that is quite opaque to us at the moment, right? Uh, and it's a problem and there's like a whole field and, you know, a profession of folks sort of slowly, steadily chipping away at transparency, accountability, fairness, those types of things. But, you know, it's not it's not a solved problem. And, and yet, you know, I think as both uh, Tremeni and, and John mentioned, like we're seeing these systems deployed in real world significant and oftentimes sensitive use cases already. Okay. So then let's move forward in some of the, the questions, uh, perhaps topics that you implicitly raised. So John talked about values in, in ethics, you know, having certain values and value system. How is that applied to your work, Trevani and Donnie? Or do you think about what is the value system for this machine learning system we're building or what's the value system for implementing generative AI? How much of that is part of the industry's definition of responsible AI and AI ethics versus strictly what we should be thinking about from an academic or a more theoretical perspective. Donnie, do you want to take it first? I feel like I took the first, I took it first last time. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, buried in there, though, I think the word has come up perhaps once or twice as sort of context dependence, which I think is absolutely huge. You know, I think we've sort of thinking through through literature um, and, and a lot of research um, that has sort of come up around um, the, uh, I, I guess these practices of, of transparency and accountability and, and um, I guess some type of providing some type of assurance or, or human accountability over these systems. Um, there's sort of a tension between the focus on the models and the fundamental technologies and then the context of use. And I think, you know, what, what in, in industry, I think the, the core challenge oftentimes is exactly that thing. It's, it's the context of use because these risks are so dependent on exactly how these types of systems are deployed that you really, you have to take every single use case as a unique evaluation asking those questions about what are the underlying values that we want to uh, consider and evaluate when we're deploying this specific system in this very specific context. And you kind of have to repeat that for every single new context of use that you think about, um, which, you know, if, if you're, if you're thinking about a company that's deploying a lot of different products, you know, trying to integrate machine learning into a lot of different features that power those products, um, it can become quite an exercise. And, and I think core to that too, because it is so context dependent, is each context is gonna have, like I mentioned earlier, a different constituency, right? There's different users and communities that are impacted, um, different legal systems and value systems that those products are operating in. And the decisions themselves are also different, right? So like, are we, are we doing automated decision-making that is affecting people directly without any human intervention and ability to control? If so, what's the feedback loop? Is there a feedback loop? How do people ha have uh, a mental model for the decisions that those systems are making so that they can then intervene and provide feedback for the next time round? So it just becomes a very complicated exercise, I think, very quickly. Um, and I don't feel that there's a single right answer. It, it is really context dependent, I think, is, is sort of the key. 
So I definitely agree with, with Donnie on the idea that like in practice, the applied ethics, the applied values will be context dependent. I will disagree in a little bit of a spicy way, which is to say that like, you look out at the, the system right now, or like look out the ecosystem and it's like NIST has a framework. Uh, the EU has an AI act. IEEE has their own thing. So-and-so has this. And so, and, and honestly, everybody's saying the same thing, right? No one's framework is that wildly different than the other person's framework. We're all talking about transparency, accountability, uh, some sort of reliability metrics, some sort of explainability factor. Uh, and, and so like there might be nuances to how we define those things or what we like, how we expect to see them play out in, in sort of practice. But broadly speaking, I think when we look at the world of AI ethics or, or, or even responsible AI, we're seeing this centralization around, we want our models, we want our systems, models aside, our data, data systems, our reporting systems, everything to be aligned in some certain way. And so when I go to clients and I talk to them about how are you going to take your values and translate them into something applied, you know, sometimes we start with those frameworks because those frameworks do cover a lot of the basics, right? We want them to be human centric and transparent and accountable, et cetera. And in other times you can take your own company values and say, how do we take these values and now start thinking about them in the context of AI? Um, and then from that, be able to then disaggregate down into here are the sort of risk trade-offs we're willing to take on these values when it comes to certain contexts, right? Like there are going to be different risk applications, right? Sometimes a lending use case is a much more high risk application than predicting if a customer is going to churn. Uh, those kinds of, con I think adding that risk factor into the context also helps sort of clear the field on why different values or different sort of applications of value values will matter uh, differently across use cases. Okay, so I want to ask one more question to the folks in the industry, and I want to turn back to John and help us bring bring this all together in some ways, bridging between the the philosophies and the applied ethics side and what the industry is doing now with respect to responsible AI, AI governance, all the things that Trevani and Donnie, you're talking about risk management audit, et cetera. So if you think about what you're doing in your company and what you see in the organizations, what are some of the best practices or programs that organizations put in place that you think should be and can be replicated across every organization that is implementing AI, which virtually today is every organization. Was that the question for John? Or for, for Trevenny. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was for, I was like, wow, John, I'm curious to hear what you have to say on this. <laughs> we'll <laughs> get back getting, to John. I was getting ready to take notes on this. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's, like I said, like, because this is a very complex field, Right, you have to start somewhere in a semi simplified way so that you can start building and then start figuring out as you're building the pieces that need to be nuanced and addressed according to different contexts, different to different industries and use cases. Right. I do see a lot of clients who come and are like, we can't talk to you for another year because we haven't figured out everything yet. And you're not stopping your AI development in that one year. So aren't you just kind of perpetuating the same problem, like let's get started with something. Um, so what we typically do is start folks off with an actual like established value system or established framework that fits their context, right? If it is, if they're in the EU, people really like the EU AI Act. Um, the NIST framework has been great. Um, and we've seen a lot of companies that are based in the US also kind of gravitate towards the values laid out by um, the sort of the ethics committees in, in the European Union. So just starting with that, um, being able to take from that then um, a set of like guiding principles for AI to say that, okay, well, we want our AI systems to do this. Um, we want to make sure we're only using AI where it's absolutely necessary and relevant to the use case. You know, we're not taking this sledgehammer of AI to every single thing. Um, and then from there, starting to build out the practices around what are the actual in indicators on this value? What are the criteria to show that we've actually um, thought about the risks, indicated those risks to the data scientist or data analyst team that's building this. How have they actually told us that they're actually 
checking for these things while building, and then you know documenting, tracing, and reporting all of that back up to some sort of oversight or governance team, um, which sounds quite similar to what <laughs> Donnie's gonna Donnie seems to be doing. But I, I'm curious to also hear a little bit more from the internal audit side. Yeah, I mean, you know, sort of thinking across uh, the industry and, and 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 broader also in terms of organizations deploying machine learning. I think we're kind of at an interesting point where, you know, certainly there there are organizations out there that are are using or experimenting or or thinking about using AI that maybe are not quite attuned to a lot of the conversations that have been going on around principles and governance. But I do think that's in a sense a bit of a dying breed. Like I think the conversation has been elevated to the extent that, you know, at least when you encounter someone, they are familiar with the conversation. They are familiar with the topics of conversation, the concerns and the risks at least at a high like macro level. And so I think for, you know, organizations as, as I kind of see the world, um, they're maybe starting from that point where like, okay, I have the nest, I have something in the EU, I have something in Singapore, wherever I happen to be, that kind of frames how maybe from a principles perspective, I want to tackle the development and deployment of AI. And okay, I kind of know sort of maybe how to do that, which is like, you know, I've got other financial regulatory obligations or certification obligations or other compliance obligations. Um, and, you know, I have teams and mechanisms and processes to kind of like govern those things. But then I think where I sort of see the disconnect right now is turning that the, the principles and that the governance that that like try to uh, align the organization around those principles. The gap to me is is the operational piece, which is how do we take those principles and the governance layer we applied and how do we push it down the organization and like really operationalize it. So that when folks are on the ground building these models, they know the risks that they need to think of. They understand the framing that the organization has, has placed around the development and deployment of these systems. And they're thinking about those things and there's mechanisms and forums and escalation paths and review councils and all those things that they are aware of and know ex that, that they exist and how to plug into those. And I think it's, it's building that connective tissue I think that that is sort of like a struggle for a lot of organizations right now that are thinking about deploying this. And, you know, to Trevetti's point, I think um, the, the earlier you start to think about this as an organization, the better, because if it's 10 years down the road and you've been deploying and building ML systems for 10 years, it is very difficult to unwind that and to like put some sort of governance structure like all the way down the organization. I think the time to be thinking about those risks, which is, I think, similar for startups and smaller companies, is to build for the future. To think about what am I going to need to do? What am I going to need to be compliant at? I have a sense for my growth trajectory. Um, how can I build those mechanisms, processes, institutions, and policies today to kind of set me up for success in the future? Yeah, and, absolutely. And your, oh, oh, sorry. One thing I just want to follow up on to your point, Donnie, I think that like you're right that these financial risk man management like structures and organizations already exist. So like if you're a finance, if you're a finance group, or even if you're not, right, like model risk management as a concept, as a field exists. It's like not that hard to start there and then build on that. Um, I, it's like, I think people get stopped up because it's like, we have to build something brand new and you really don't. Well, I actually uh, think so. that there's a real risk in doing that. So like, if Ooh. you take, if you take biomedical ethics as an example, they built up a set of very careful operationalized tools to manage the values that are most relevant to clinical research. They're very bad tools for managing values of health and big data analytics. So like the privacy protection of removing birth date and social security number is nothing in the face of big data analytics to prevent invasive inferences about particular individuals. So I actually worry about taking the tools of traditional risk management and sort of like as an off the shelf solution without careful modification and recontextualization. So there are lots of tools and, and interesting things to draw from, but they, it, there is a sort of ground up element to it. I think if you don't want to sort of make everything look like a nail to a hammer. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll maybe just add to that too. Like, you know, that that's something that I, I think about a lot too. You know, if we sort of think about the tradition of risk management uh, and of the audit profession writ large, again, super anchored on financial risk. Like, you know, I sort of uh, cut my teeth as a young auditor when the whole idea of 
like computerized systems being deeply bedded into business processes is like a thing that maybe started happening 10 years ago and like, oh my goodness, what do we do about it as auditors? What are the skills that we need? Who are the people who need a seat at the table to understand how we bring that into audit? What do we now need to audit? What are the skills? You know, what are the frameworks? So I kind of like, I mean, I hesitate to see that I say that I see the same pattern repeating, but I am concerned that we're repeating the same pattern too about like, not bringing the right people to the table and not understanding that this is like a multi-dimensional problem that's going to require more than just a bunch of folks from like a finance background sitting in a room applying sort of a framework that they're looking at for the first time and i think a lot of times the people we're not bringing to the table are the people who are affected by not good ai right and like that's the thing that's the difference um where we could do a lot better than existing models of like bioethics or financial risk so I'll come back to what Trevani and Donnie, you were talking about, um, and we got a good sense of what the industry is doing. I think both of you represent uh, the stewards of uh, AI deployment uh, from, from a different perspective. So now back to John. So you work with industry as well. So how do we connect between what you are researching on apply ethics and everything you have heard from the practitioners, what are we missing? What do we need to do? What are some of the innovative thinkings from your research and your colleagues' research that we can further apply to industry practice? Yeah, that's a, another hard question. Uh, this um, it's a massively multi-dimensional problem. So, like, I am uh, I'm sympathetic to the idea that there's a general convergence on the kind of values we need to realize, and then the real challenge is operationalizing those, and that's a context-sensitive process. But one of the things I think that's true in the absence of a kind of robust guidance or robust ethics ecosystem is we actually need to manage two tasks. How do we do operationalizations that allow for a kind of compliance approach to are we meeting our AI ethics goals, but also are our AI ethics goals good? So like one of the problems I find with lots of these toolkits and frameworks is just like, here's a framework, have fun. And it's like pick and choose your own adventure about which one speaks to you that given day. So I actually think there's work to do to figure out which, which the framework is actually useful at getting to meaningful operationalizations. But then there's another part that's not about compliance. There's just, we're just at the point where we need frontline workers to recognize when they're hitting an ethical challenge, it's not covered by any of their operationalizations, that the audit team hasn't built tools to address. And they need to be able to, not everyone can be an ethicist, but they need to have enough language to sort of reach out and grab the kinds of resources they need to solve the problem as best they can in situ. And so I think there's tons of room for academics to provide enough of a shared language, enough of the sort of resources or contacts so that someone in the organization can find the right pathway to solving a problem as best we can, given the circumstances we're in, which won't be perfect. Um, but we, we just, we really lack that kind of language. When I give talks at, at, in, in organizations, people want to know how to, well, first they say, what's the right fairness metric? And I say, no, that's the wrong, there, there's no right fairness metric. Um, and then they ask, like, I, how do I do this? How do, what's the right rules to follow and things like this? And it's really about, spent, we spend about 15 to 20 minutes even just creating the language to have a short conversation about what to do. And so I think philosophers, ethicists, AI ethicists, people working in the space can help contribute to that kind of shared resource space. I also think there's work for us to do on the public side. Um, like one of the challenges of bringing in key stakeholders to these decisions is they don't understand the underlying technology. And so for them, they're assessing individual behaviors of these algorithmic systems when really the locus is, was it responsibly built? And that's a hard question to assess if you don't understand the difference between machine learning and traditional software development. Um, so I think there's public, there's just a million things to do, but some of it's public facing and education on ethics, some of it's internal language creation, some of it's helping to resolve cha context specific challenges in the process of operationalizing key values. So maybe let's draw on this example of fairness. I'm gonna put you on the spot again. So you you just, talked about, well, is it the right question to ask? And perhaps we should ask different set of questions, uh, putting aside the current regulatory frameworks or guidances that we have with respect to AI governance, compliance, oversight, et cetera. So uh, using fairness as example, what should people be asking about fairness? Because fairness AI is either a separate category, or you can argue that it's a subcategory of AI and ethics. How should we think about fairness in AI? Yeah, good. So two things I want, two 
points I want to make about this. So first is you got to think about the fairness of decision systems, which is not the same as the fairness of a model. What we care about is the ultimate decision system being fair, not whether the model is fair. In fact, you might want to bias. If you know the human decision maker is biased, you might want to bias the model to counteract that. To, if you want fairness, you should counteract the, the individual bias with some bias in the algorithm. But then we also have, so that's just think socio-technically rather than at the stage of the model or any single tool. Um, you can try to capture these things at all points of the model development pipeline. The other thing I'll say is that we just have different kinds of fairness that we care about. So sometimes we care about having a fair process. Sometimes we care about having a fair distribution. And sometimes we care about restitutive fairness, making up for past injustice. And so the first question to ask is, in this context, which kind of fairness should I be most concerned with? If I'm distributing social resources, I probably care about distribution and repair and reparative or restitutive justice. If I'm making courtroom decisions or, or legal decisions, maybe procedural justice is the right fairness, the right conception of fairness. And then you can start thinking, is a metrics approach the right way to solve that problem? And what metric captures procedural fairness in this context? Otherwise, you have to look somewhere else. And so you got to start with the big picture. What's the context? What's the use case? Who's affected? What kind of fairness do I care about? And where in the system is the most effective way to intervene? And the standard, it's not, this is not so true anymore, but what was the case is everybody just wanted to generate fairness metrics um, and just say like, here's how we solve this problem at the point of the model. Here's how we create a model whose outputs are fair, balanced against accuracy. And I think that that's starting to fade as the way people view fairness due to some really good criticisms that have come out of academia and industry. Um, but we need to do that for basically every kind of value, I think. And do you think that the frameworks we have today, the frameworks that Trevani talked about and Donna represent or moving toward the direction that you're talking about, because essentially you're giving us kind of a decision tree of how to think about these questions and break it down further. And people then have uh, better ways to perhaps operationalize that in their organizations. Yeah, I, th I think companies are all at different stages of this, but like uh, if you'd asked me two years ago, I said everybody has their list of values. They're almost all the same and they mean nothing. They don't, none of them mean the same thing by them. And none of them, everyone's committed to them, but nobody has any view about how to move to that in practice. But we're a lot further along two years later. Um, and I think some companies are doing more and some doing less, but almost everyone acknowledges the problem. They say, hey, we're really committed to this. And, and in my experience, but maybe it's self-selecting, the people that come talk to me really want to do this work and it, they see it as a significant challenge and they're worried about getting it wrong. Um, and so like, but they really see that the process is really about operationalization. Um, and then it's a matter of, can you get them to see what they should be operationalizing towards rather than a sort of strict legal compliance model? What else is there to try to build values in? But but I do see movement in the right direction in, in lots of industry that I work with. Okay. So I'm just watching the time because we still hope to give our audience a little bit of time to network with the panelists. So let me move to a topic that I think we have to talk about, which is generative AI and chat GPT. And I'm confident that if not everyone in the audience, most of the audience members know about chat GPT, these large generative models that essentially can generate human-like sentences, content, et cetera. So how should we think about this from an ethics perspective? How do we deal with this as now this is all productionized in the hands of consumers, students, teachers, marketers, everyone. I'll just say something quick and then let Trevani and Donnie jump in. Uh, but like this is the, when I used to tell people I worked in AI ethics, they immediately asked me about trolley cases and autonomous vehicles. If my text message list is any indication, I'm now only gonna get asked about language, large language models. Like I have 15 texts from colleagues and friends asking what to do about LLMs. I mean, I think they raise fascinating issues and I have some thoughts about, I think it's slightly overhyped the worries, at least in my sector, uh, higher education, but I'll let Trevani and, and Donnie jump in. Okay, we'll come back to you though. Well, I'm sure Donnie will tell you that like large language models are not new. And like chat GPT is not new. So like all of the hype around it, honestly, again, another spicy comment, but this is what I do. I'm kind of bored by ChatGPT and like talking about ChatGPT because it's like, okay, it's a large language model, congratulations. Um, and the ethics of it around like, okay, are we using it? Are students using it to like cheat on their assignments or um, could people use it to like do other things? I think that like, there was a question maybe in the chat around like generative AI and like art and how those training data sets are being stolen from artists. And like, as someone who follows a lot of artists on Instagram, like I personally feel that that's, a big problem and 
I think we can agree kind of ethically, you shouldn't be stealing people's art and using it to train models. Um, so I think that like there are ethical concerns around like, what does it mean to build these things off of like so-called public data when it's really still like a picture of my face, I still feel like is my own face. And so is this being used in some sort of generative AI or is something that I wrote on LinkedIn being like scraped and used to then build a large language model? That's kind of more of the bigger picture e-ethics questions I think about when it comes to this stuff. Um, I think that operationally for large language models in companies, like I, I don't think there's as many concerns yet. I think the bigger concern there is telling people, hey, you're talking to a chatbot right now, or hey, the information that's being presented to you is the result of a, an AI system. That's the kind of tendency I go towards, but curious to hear what, what Donny has to think too. Yeah, I mean, I think the the interesting thing about ChatGPT is, you know, I hesitate to say it's the, the first general purpose model that's, well, maybe the, the better way to phrase this, it's, it's, it's the first uh, incredibly zero barrier to entry accessible large language model that has been maybe served to the public uh, that is not like on very defined rails, right? And so like, I, I think all of us have been talking a lot about context, right? And so I think part of, as an organization that might be developing these systems, you know, part of the thinking in deploying these types of models might be that, okay, I'm sensitive to, to, to the risks that this model poses in terms of grounding, um, you know, in terms of bias or toxicity, those types of things. And so part of my solution in deploying those systems might be to deploy them on a very tight set of rails. And so I'm going to control the context. I'm going to control the user input. It's not going to be unbounded. I'm going to control like how it's used, right? And so when I do that, it kind of narrows the problem space quite a lot to one that might be more tractable to do mitigations like, um, you know, screening for toxicity or screening for bias or screening for factual accuracy. And, and there's a lot of approaches to kind of like do that stuff. But the thing is that only really works at like a more bounded, bounded scale, right? And so I think the big thing about ChatGPT and the way that OpenAI has decided to release that to basically anyone with an internet connection um, is that it, it's relatively unbounded. Like now they do have like protections and they keep, um, it, it kind of sounds like by their, their release notes that they keep working on factual accuracy, grounding, you know, issues of bias, um, you know, adversarial like types of scenarios, but it, otherwise it's unconstrained in terms of how you can use it. And so I think that has maybe, you know, for the first time, at least in the public consciousness, sort of like ripped wide open Pandora's box in terms of like possible applications in possible contexts, right, for a variety of different purposes. So it, it is interesting to see kind of how like interesting ways that people are finding of uh, using chat GPT that might be entirely unexpected. So if you were to, you know, be an organization to release this on a very narrow set of rails, you probably went some through some thought process to figure out what do I want to deploy this for? What do I want to allow it to do? Um, and, you know, you can only have so many people in the room thinking about possible applications, right? And so when you open it to the whole internet, you're kind of opening it to all the boundless creativity that people out there have in terms of how they apply this model and, and, and what they try to use it for. So, you know, uh, no answers, but probably more questions have been raised, I think, over the last like month or change or since it's been released than, you know, I think a, a couple folks you know, locked in a room would have been able to think through in, uh, you know, in an indefinite amount of time. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before we turn to John and have the last words on, on this is that I think you're absolutely right. Some of the question raised, not many answers. What does something like a chat GPT, which everybody has, uh, does to critical thinking, does to copyrights, uh, does to future of work, because he, people can see automation of certain tasks going away. W what's its impact to education, pursuit of knowledge, et cetera. But bring it back to, as John, you said, a couple of years ago, people were talking about autonomous vehicle. And if the autonomous vehicle hits 
an individual or something whose fault is that? And that was like the question in AI and ethics. And every class I remember was using this example to demonstrate or to get students to think about ethical considerations in AI. Now we have a new example, which is chat GPT or providing these large language models, making it more accessible with a friendly user interface to everyone. The consumerization of AI. So what are the right ethical questions or considerations that people should be thinking about or asking no matter where we are, whether you're students or people working today? Yeah, so I think it's going to be different questions and different kinds of answers across different sectors. So I'll just say a little bit about education. So I, I'm actually not worried about it at the kind of institution I teach at was an elite institution where students want to get A's and not C pluses. And where part of my job is teaching people how to use tool, like it's about taking advantage of tools to get them to learn critical thinking. So like some people hate Wikipedia. I encourage my students to use it and then but they have to make sure that the information is vetted and well used. If a if chat GPT got asked to do one of my assignments, it would do poorly. Um, but I've just told my students try to do it. Um, and if you think it'll pass, then have fun. Um, but it, I think as we evolve, we'll just say things like generate a prompt with chat GPT and then give me a critical analysis of it. So you can take advantage of the tool to get the same kind of outcomes you want. Now, the scary things I think about chat GPT are like, it's an incredible bullshitter. And we can just create misinformation as fast as we want and generate a lot of it. And one thing I worry about, sorry to bring up Google in this respect, but basically it's lowered the, the sort of, it might have lowered the ethical stakes for other people to get involved. So Google has basically said, they released ChatGPT. We were, we were not releasing our model for, because we were trying to keep it on rails. Um, but now, as a, now they have a competitive reason to get that out there because Bing purchased or, Google, or Microsoft purchased ChatGPT for use with Bing. So I think I worry more about how, what it's going to mean for future iterations of large language models and the sort of unintended consequences rather than as a large language model, it can do some clever things. It's an interesting piece of technology, um, but I'm not so worried about in the education sector. We'll, we've adapted to calculators. We've adapted to Wikipedia. Uh, pretty soon my university will almost certainly have a subscription to some chat GPT detector that's just part of student submissions. So I think that that's not where the transformation is going to come from. It's going to come from its broader social applications that we don't quite aren't quite thinking about yet. I think future of work questions are pretty interesting. ChatGPT can write a perfect letter from the dean welcoming the faculty back to the to campus for the spring. So deans, watch out. Okay, uh, last question uh, for our panelists. Working this field from different perspectives, what's the top question that keep you up at night when you think about AI? What worries you? I got one ready to go. Uh, so. Every other field where we've built an ethics ecosystem, except one that I can think of, came about because there was some ethical disaster that motivated strict regulation to solve this problem. I don't, given the failings we already had with AI, I don't even know what that would look like to be motivate the regulation. I'm too worried that regulatory agencies are captured and unlikely to sort of use their teeth to actually help solve these problems. So I worry about, can the good-hearted people that want to solve this problem keep up with the threats to democracy, to values and things like that. That's that's the thing I worry about most. Donnie, try. Uh, yeah, that was a that's a that's a ringer. Now I'm gonna have a sleepless night because I didn't. You're right that like if the stuff that's already gone bad isn't doing it, what will? Um, though I will say that we have been seeing a lot more rags coming out. It's just that will they have the teeth or not is remains to be seen. Um, but I think what keeps me up at night is like the is like the broader back to your point earlier, John, about the public and education. I think that like I have learned so much just even in the like past three, four years of growing as a data scientist, growing as someone like bridging the gap between industry and academia. Um, if you're not at all familiar with data, it's like AI is just a cool thing you saw on Twitter or like ChatGPT is your first foray into really AI. Like, what are you thinking? How do we help the public understand that like, this is not AI, this is not the only kind of AI out there. And like, there's a lot more that you should be concerned about and that you should be pushing for to be better. Um, so like that public, public education piece. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, also drafting off of something that John mentioned about this idea of grounding and, you know, especially if we focus on question answering systems like ChatGPT, they can sound quite convincing, 
in whatever it is that they present, however they answer the question. And, you know, just sort of anecdotally, you know, talking to friends and family about the sort of watching them use the system. Uh, and, and actually, you know, uh, Tremeni, this, this is directly related to your point that you just made as well. Like, I'm not sure that, that folks generally understand the limitations of these systems. And, you know, it's kind of the classical, like, Eliza problem, which, you know, when, when a system appears just competent enough, it's very easy to kind of like ascribe a whole lot of things and characteristics to the system that it might not have in, 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 in reality, right? And so that, that's maybe something that I worry about a bit is folks maybe using the system in ways that um, were you a bit more familiar with the technology, technology, you would kind of fundamentally understand that like it just doesn't work well in those particular contexts. But because to John's point, it sounds so convincing, that's what you run with. Um, and you know, it's it's one thing to submit your your English paper or your your math homework. God forbid, that's a terrible idea. Uh, that way, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's quite another thing to like automate decision making with those same misconceptions at a very large scale that these systems allow. Yeah, absolutely. I I agree with all these points. And uh, one of the audience members said is. AI ethics, a people problem, AI problem. And I think actually that nicely sum, sum up today's event is, you know, AI ultimately is a technology that people have built, it's a set of algorithms, and ultimately humans are here to make these decisions and have to uh, rely on their own judgment. And so how do we, I think one of the themes that came out today, even though we're still scratching the surface of this topic, is how do we teach people make decisions and living alongside uh, these tools or operating along this side tools and for students and future generation, how do we, how do we teach some judgment uh, as the world will uh, have more AI tools inevitably. So uh, we'll actually go into breakouts uh, for a couple of minutes. I think it's great and nice for people to say hi to our panelists and we'll come back in about five minutes or so and uh, we'll adjourn the session. So Natalie, if you can, please open the breakouts. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm gonna open them now. If you can't see them when you um, when they pop up, you just have to click breakouts on your navigation bar in the bottom and choose uh, whose room you wanna join. 